Hello and welcome to Mrs. Ballard's class. Today we are going to talk about calculus topics 1.6 and 1.7. So we're going to be determining limits using algebraic manipulation and selecting procedures for determining limits. So um, our objectives for the day, our essential question is what is the correct procedure for finding the limit? And then I can select and use the correct limit procedure, including direct substitution, factor and cancel, conjugates, complex fractions, manipulating x plus h, and piecewise. So we're going to see a lot of different um, types of problems today. Again, reminder that you can always pause the videos um, and go back, or if I write too fast or go too fast, you can go back and listen to it a second time. So let's pop into here. Hopefully you wrote your essential question down. Let me go ahead and flip this. Okay. So we are going to start making sure again that my my name is written up here, and make sure and preferably in pen. So we've got some basic limit rules, things that are always true, that are super super simple things. Um, that's why they're called basic. Um, so first of all, B and C are real numbers, meaning they could be any number, um, like one or two or negative five or 0.5 or one third, um, and then and n be a positive integer. Um, and then, so the limit as x approaches c of b equals b. So if it's just a limit of a number, so any number they give me, it is just that number. Um, the limit as x approaches c of x, I just basically take and put that c in for the x, and it is c. It's what we call direct substitution. So you might want to write direct substitution meaning I'm going to go ahead and just plug right into the function and I should get the answer. And then if I put C into this, I'm going to direct substitute in, I would get C to the N. All right, so we're going to use those properties. We're going to look at real basic ones here to begin with. So um, I'm doing the limit as X approaches two of six. So of a number, I just get that number. There's no variable to plug anything into. Um, I'm going to go ahead and plug this in technically if I was using the properties that we saw in the last lesson, I really should split it up. I never do this. I'm only showing you this because that's the official proper way to do it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and I'll plug in the three. So we've got two times three squared and then this limit of X approaches three is just one. So let's see nine, two times nine plus one. I'm showing a lot of steps, 18 plus one, which is 19 for my final answer. Um, I'm not going to show, well, I'm going to show, I guess I'll show it split up a little bit. So I'm just going to show, I'm not going to show this much split up. I'm going to take the limit of the numerator and the denominator. So limit as x approaches 1 of 2x squared minus 3x plus 5 over the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 2. And again, I probably wouldn't do that. I'm just trying to show you as proper as I can right now. I'm going to go ahead and plug in the 1. So I've got 2 times 1 squared minus 3 times 1 plus 5 over one plus two. So let's see, one squared is one times two is two. Negative three times one is negative three plus five. My denominator is three. So let's see, I've got two minus three is negative one plus five is four. So my limit is four thirds. All right, I'm gonna direct substitute in the pi for the limit as x approaches pi of cosine of x. So I get cosine of pi. Oh, so we're back in our good old unit circle world. So I know pi is this radian measure right here, and that coordinate is negative 1, 0. Cosine is the x value of that coordinate, so the cosine of pi is negative 1. So we actually had this function, I think, on one of our notes a couple days ago. Um, and we saw that there was a hole in this graph. And what happens is there's they, basically we can come up with a, the limit by, um, by filling in that hole. Well, if you look at this, because um, these are basically um, functions that agree in all but one point. If you, I tried to plug the one into there, so I get one minus one, which is zero, and we're not allowed to put that in the denominator. So I can't just direct substitute in. So sometimes I have to do something else. And one of the other things that I can do is I can factor and cancel and then I can plug in. So let's try it. So then it would agree in all except for that one point. I don't know why I'm doing a division sign. So x approaches one. So um, 
cube factoring, it's probably been a while, right? Actually, I'm writing way too small. Let's not write this right here. Let's write it underneath. So we've got um, the limit as x approaches 1 of, so cube factoring, it's an oldie bit of goodie. Remember, you start with the whatever sign is there, and then there's it's either minus plus plus or plus minus plus. So we've got two pluses. Take the cube root of x, take the cube root of 1, then we square the first one, square the back one, and then we multiply together for the middle, ignoring the sign. And then we've just got an x minus 1 on the bottom. And lo and behold, yay, those guys cancel. So now I'm really looking for the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus x plus 1. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute that in. So 1 squared um, plus 1 plus 1. So I've got 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3. And if you even look on the graph, it looks like it was definitely at 3. All right, so I'm going to look I'm going to notice that same thing. When I plug a negative 2 in there, I'm going to get a 0. So I need to do something else. So I'm going to try factoring this. So we're really getting the limit as x approaches negative 2. You know, I'm going to have the x plus 2 in the denominator. So a trinomial, we know we need to use the magic x. So we need two numbers that multiply to negative 10 and add to negative 3. So I think 5 and 2 work. It looks like the 5's got to be negative. So we've got x minus 5 and x plus 2. What do you know? The x plus 2 popped up. So those guys, oops, sorry. Those guys cross. So I'm really looking for the limit as x approaches negative 2 of x minus 5. I'm going to take that negative 2 and plug it in. So we get negative 2 minus 5, which is negative 7. All right, so this approach that we're taking today, we've seen it, when, remember when we did the tables? Oops, sorry. There's three approaches we take in, in calculus. The, when we did the tables, that's the numeric approach, um, or numerical. And when we see graphs, that's hopefully, you know, is the graphical approach. And then when we see um, problems or variables, okay. Um, and we're using algebra. That is what we call the analytic. Analytic. I'm not sure I spelled that right. Analytic approach. So these are, we have to approach these from these three ways every type of problem that we do. So today we're doing that analytic approach. All right. Let's take a look at what we've got here. So obviously I cannot put direct substitute in a zero. So there's another thing that we've talked about before called the conjugate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate of this. This typically happens, notice the structure of it. It's got a square root in it. Typically happens when we see that. Um, I'm going to do the conjugate, and the sign that I'm going to change is um, the negative sign there. So the limit as x approaches 0, I'm going to rewrite just the original problem, minus 1 over x, and I'm going to multiply top and bottom by x plus 1 plus 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. All right, um, and remember with conjugates, there was a little bit of a shortcut. Let me do a pair of conjugates really quick. So we say we've got x plus 1, and we don't have the radical in it, and I multiply by its conjugate of x minus 1. If I go ahead and FOIL that out, x times x is x squared, x times negative 1 is negative 1x, one, 1 times x is positive x, and 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Well, we know that the middle cancels, so the O and the I cancel. So you really only have to do the first and the last when you see con when you recognize conjugates and you're multiplying binomials. Well, these binomials just look a little crazier. It's only two terms. It's the square root term and the and the numeric term. So I'm just going to do I'm going to do that same thing. I know they're conjugates. We forced that. So I'm just going to multi I'm just going to do first and last. So square root of x plus 1 times square root of x plus 1 would just be x plus 1. And then negative 1 times positive 1 is negative 1. And I am not going to be quick to distribute that. I'm just going to leave it on the outside. Sometimes we do things too quickly. All right. So now I notice that my 1s cancel. So now I have the limit as x approaches 0 of x over x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. 
Well, what do you know? Now my x is canceled, but remember my numerator, I still have a one. So now I have the limit as x approaches zero of one over the square root of x plus one plus one. Now I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my zero with direct substitution. So zero plus one plus one, and I end up with one over, zero plus one is one, square root of one is one, so I get one half on this. All right, I'm gonna try to squeeze some space in here for my other problem. Um, so the now I've got a situation where I've got complex fractions. Again, I cannot directly substitute that zero in because it would give me zero in the denominator. So I need to figure out how to get rid of that. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to combine these fractions in the numerator together. So I've got the limit as x approaches zero. I'm gonna keep my x in my denominator. I'm gonna look for a common denominator here. So I know I would have to multiply those two things together to get a common denominator. So I'm gonna use the common denominator of two times x plus two. So I know that the, what's missing in this denominator is a two, so I have to multiply that by two. What's missing in this denominator is an x plus two. I'm gonna distribute through a negative, so negative x minus two, okay? Um, I'm noticing that my twos cancel, so I've now got the limit as x approaches zero of negative x over two times x plus two. I'm doing something at the same time here. We know that this denominator is really x over one. In order to get a complex fraction out of the denominator, I multiply by its reciprocal. So hopefully that shows you now that these guys cancel and I've really got the limit as x approaches zero of negative one over two times x plus two. Sometimes the math is just about rearranging it to make it something that we are now able to solve. So we basically did some simplification, didn't change the problem in any way, and now have something that we can plug zero into. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my zero. Two times zero plus two. Zero plus two is two times two is four, so negative one fourth. All right, the next one seems super crazy. It seems super intimidating to see this big thing. I promise you we're doing it because um, we're gonna see something like this later on in the next unit. Um, and I want you to be prepared for it when you see it. Um, so just like the others, I cannot directly substitute in the H. So my advice would be, I know I can foil some stuff it looks like here. I'm gonna see if I can do some of that and see if anything cancels, okay? Um, so I'm gonna still keep my limit notation. So limit as X approaches H. And then um, I'm going to foil this out. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of work off to the side with that. So I'm going to foil off to the side. So x plus h times x plus h would be x squared. There's This would be xh, and I have two of those. So 2xh, then h times h is h squared. Then I know I've got to multiply it by 4. So I'm going to multiply it by 4, and I'm going to write my answer here. Okay. All right, so I've got 4x squared, sorry. That one too small. Okay, so 4x squared, um, plus if I keep going on my rainbow here, I've got um, 8xh, and then 4h squared. And then now I'm gonna distribute that negative three in, so negative 3x minus 3h, and then there's a plus two. And then we've got a minus 4x squared plus 3x minus 2. All right, so let's see what happens. Let's see if we can find anything that cancels. I'm noticing I've got 4x squareds that cancel. I am noticing, oh, look at the 3x squared. 3x's cancel. Ooh, and look at the 2's cancel. So I'm going to put that. Notice how I just... To make an indicator to myself, I drew my little slashes different ways to cross things out so I knew what I paired with what. So I'm going to rewrite this and see what happens. So the limit as x approaches h of 8a at 8xh plus 4h squared minus 3h is what's left. Interesting. So 
one of the first things we did was we factored. Well, another type of factoring is greatest common factor. So I'm gonna, I notice there's an H in each of these. So I'm gonna take out that greatest common factor of H. So I've got 8X plus 4H minus 3 left behind over H. And what do you know? My H's cancel. So now I have the limit as X approaches, what happened? It was not supposed to be approaching H. This is a typo. This should have been a zero the whole time. I apologize for that. All right, so it's 8x plus 4h minus 3. So the only thing I'm substituting in for as a, and this shouldn't have been an x. This should have been an h. Boy, oh boy, have I got the typos. All right. So that's going to be an H. And so I'm only plugging into the variable that has the H in it. So I'm doing 8X plus 4 times 0 minus 3. So I get 8X minus 3 as my limit. And it's okay to have that variable in the limit on this one. All right, just a couple left. We're going to look at piecewise. So piecewise, you're always going to have to examine your right and your left hand limits because um, you've got two different branches of the function and we don't know if it's continuous or not until we do that. Um, so I'm just gonna do each branch. Um, your top branch is typically your left branch because it's the less than or, branch, or the it says that it's to the left. And this said, this is saying that it's to the right of the point. So that's your right branch. So I'm gonna do the limit as X approaches two from the left of, and I'm just gonna go ahead and write this function in there, three X squared minus one. So I'm gonna direct substitute in the two. Um, so I've got three times two squared minus one. I know that two squared is four, three times four is 12, 12 minus one is 11. All right, and then I'm gonna go from the left or the right side. So X or minus, or limit as X approaches two from the right, and I'm gonna use this bottom branch now, five X plus two. I'm gonna plug in my two, and we've got 10 plus two, which is 12. And you'll notice that my right and my left hand limit do not match. So we can say therefore, those three little dots mean therefore, um, the limit, as x approaches two of f of x does not exist. And you can write d and e is fine. All right, and then the last one we're gonna to do today is this absolute value one. So um, we've actually graphed something similar to this before. Um, if I did graph this, you're gonna notice that the graph kind of looks something like this. Um, it's probably gonna come down here like this and then be up here like this. And the graph doesn't matter what number I put in here. It looks the same. It just is where the break is is a little bit different. The break is wherever this, the opposite sign of wherever this value is at. So this would be like at four. Um, but it always, always, always has the same number here. So the way we do absolute value is remember absolute value represents both positive and negative numbers. So I'm going to split this into actually into two separate expressions. Um, so I'm going to say we're going to look for the limit as x approaches four from the left side and the left side would be a negative side. So I'm gonna use a negative sign in front. And then I'm also gonna approach from the right side limit, sorry, my limit gets sloppy as X approaches four from the right and my right side is the positive side. So I don't put anything in front of the X because I'm splitting my absolute value into a positive expression and a negative expression. You notice X minus four, X minus four cancels. So my limit is just negative one and here it's one. So I can't have a limit on that because my two branches of that don't, because of the way the graph is, it doesn't exist. There's a jump function right there. So we would say therefore limit as X approaches four, the absolute value of X minus four over X minus four does not exist. And that's the end of today's lesson.